<laughs> when you're in Atlanta, mm-hmm. let's get into the ball scene in Atlanta. Uh-huh. How did you even stumble into this? So back in the in, in back in my day, uh, you know, people would hand out paper flyers to their events at the club. And so I was out with like my play brother at the time. He was like my big brother in the big brother program. Mm-hmm. And he happened to be gay, but he was he promised my mom he was like, I'll guide him around and take care of him and stuff. And so he would take me to the clubs and look after me. And then I stumbled across a flyer for the Escada Awards Ball in 2000. And I was like, what is this? And he was like, do you want to go? We can check it out. And then that was my first ball. And I was hooked. And I think like maybe two weeks later, uh, I was recruited at this club called Palace downtown in Atlanta by this guy I actually saw at tracks and thought he was cute. But then he ended up recruiting. He wanted me to be in drag. I was like, oh, okay. So. Did you perform in a category? Was Did you have? I walked, um, you know, in ballroom scene, uh, the femme queens mm-hmm. or transsexual, what mainstream would know as transsexuals, uh, uh, male to female transsexuals. Mm-hmm. And then we have like trans men. And then we have butch queens, which is like a, a gay guy. Um, and then butch queen and drags, which is what I represent. I walk. Butch Queen and Drag's face. What was that like? Do you ever miss it? I know I still dabble in it. Um, yeah. I opened a chapter. Um, me and my brother Dabrian uh, opened a chapter of Balenciaga in the West Coast. So now I'm in more of like a mentorship role. Well, I've always kind of been in a mentorship role um, when it came to the House of Balenciaga. But um, yeah, that's where my concentration is now. Like making sure that I have like solid roots and um, making sure my legacy sticks around a little bit longer than me. It's it's incredible to think about that you were were you one of the first or were you the first ballroom queen on Drag Race? Yes, yeah. What what's the process? How did you learn? Um, I was fortunate enough to have amazing mentors. Um, my drag mother, who do, no longer does drag, uh, Keetrick Starks. He's a celebrity makeup artist. He actually does Jill Scott's makeup. Yeah, uh, he's very talented. And my drag grandmother, Alicia Paris. Um, they taught me the fundamentals Mm -hmm. of how to lay down the groundwork. And they always said, like, once you learn your face, nobody will be able to paint you like you. And it's, it's true. They taught me the foundation and was just like, girl, we're not going to keep flying everywhere Mm -hmm. with you to paint you for a ball, bitch. It's like, you better learn. And I surely did. But it was a, it was a step-by-step process. It's like, I had to get good at my foundation. Then I got good at my IB and then, you know, my eyebrows is a whole different process. But everything kind of like turned up on its head after Drag Race because I didn't think I was drag enough. Uh And so I started experimenting with like monster drag makeup. And thank goodness people respect me enough not to post those pictures. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we're going to... No, I'm kidding. (laughs) Expose. Expose. Y'all keep those for your personal collection. For the personal collection. So when it comes down to like what a typical night was in Atlanta... You were going to go to a ball tonight. I want to like know what your process was like. Oh, that's delicious. Okay. So we would probably go. I would go CVS, grab my nair, because I would have to lock in. It would be like a three, four hour process where I would have like wine. Friends would come over. I would nair and, you know, do a little bit on my face, step away from it, come back, Mm -hmm. shoot the shit with the girls. And because I had to lock into like, the Mariah character because I was doing balls like maybe once every two or three months. Okay. So it was just like not like working every exactly. night. So it was more of a process. And then we would go get to the ball probably about like 12, 12, one o'clock. We'd leave there about six thirty seven in the morning. <laughs> and then I would be like, cause I was always the youngest of the group. Mm-hmm. So I was like, oh my gosh. I was just like, yes, we're about to go. My feet hurt. I'm hungry. They're like, all right. And then Jack Mizrahi he would be on the mic and he would be like, all right, bitches, I'll see you at back streets. And then I was like, what? And everybody like, girl, come on. And I was like, y'all can just leave me in the car. They would crack the window, leave me with a bowl of water. And I would wake up at 12 in like the afternoon. And they were like, I'm like, good. Finally, we can go home. They were like, oh, let's go to Waffle House, bitch. I was like, oh, my God, it never ends. Then we go home, sleep, wake up, and then go to the next bar. <laughs> it's a, It would be a ball is not just a night. It's like a whole It's weekend. a whole experience. It's a whole experience. I want to know from you. So you're, 
you're doing the ball scene and RuPaul's Drag Race more so in the drag scene. Mm -hmm. What made you want to audition or did you audition? I did audition. I wanted to audition for season two, but I was like focused on getting my mom situated and taken care of. And I knew I wouldn't be able to focus on both of those. So I waited till season three and I had a very strong sense uh, that I would get on the first time auditioning because I knew nobody else had my uh, like my background. I know all the players in ballroom. So I knew, and especially with a lot of Rue's catchphrases and her referencing Paris is burning, I, I knew that she would immediately like click with that. And so I really didn't have a doubt that I was going to get it. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was like, girl, but I think everybody should feel that way about themselves. Yeah. So. And then when I got the call, I kind of like, where were you? I was like, um, I was like, I was with one of my friends, uh, two of my friends, um, Shannon Balenciaga, who was on Legendary season two, and then my friend Shane Tomlinson, who passed in Pulse. Okay. They were both with me, and I was just like, "Girl, hold on, y'all, hold on, real quick. I'm supposed to be by myself." And so <laughs> we were at some restaurant in Atlanta, and I was like, "Oh my gosh, are you so serious?" Uh, you know, I was like having an ex surprise, but I was like, "Okay, let's." get this process started. But I had already started getting stuff made the minute I turned my tape in. I want to read a quote that uh -oh. you had. Exposed. <laughs> it was after your time on season three and an interviewer asked you, did you learn anything from the other drag performers on the show? And you responded, you know what? I really didn't. I've always hung around older people and the drag community was not much different from my regular life. And I've gravitated towards people who are polished. Mm -hmm. Do you still stand by by that? From oh, your absolutely. The people from my upbringing, the people that I studied, were Raquel Lord, mm -hmm. um, Stasha Sanchez, Jasmine Bonet, Nicola Dupree, Naisha Dupree. Like pretty much the cast of um, uh, in Atlanta uh, at the tracks at the track show, and it there's no there was no comparison. Yeah. There, there really wasn't. And so it was like I everything that I had learned before I had gotten there had gotten me ready for that point. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think there was anybody I could really take notes from when it mm -hmm. came to like pulling myself together. Now, I have since gained a respect for some of the other girls' skill yeah. sets and talents. But at that moment in time, no. <laughs> I was laughing so hard when I read that. <laughs> Literally, I was like, I thought you were going to give a pageant answer. And I was like, no, no. <laughs> yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I do have to give a shout out because it's the longest running show in Atlanta. Yes. And it's the Stars of the Century. Give the shout out to your camera. Oh, <laughs> shout out to Stars of the Century. If y'all are in Atlanta and y'all want to see some fabulous drag, sickening drag, uh, it can't be touched. So... Check them out. They're at the Heretic every Monday. Oh, I miss that. Yeah. <laughs> so many places. Oh, looping back around, that was where my first performance performance was. Wait, was really? At the Heretic. It was for a um, closet ball pageant. Okay. And ironically, uh, ironically enough, Nicole Page Brooks won. Stop. Yes, it was. That was my first pageant. You had to come out, do a performance, have gown. And then I think there was something else that we had to do. And it was it was cute. My sister went with me and my drag grandmother was with me. And it was a good time. Then we went to the tracks afterwards. <laughs> you get off of RuPaul's Drag Race. Mm -hmm. In the episode, something controversial happened. And it's been talked about quite, quite uh, a bit on the Reddit forums. Yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Your lipstick mirror message was erased. It was. Uh, yeah. Why do you think that was? Because you said congrat congratulations, Raja, right? Mm -hmm. I actually said congratulations, Raja, on the runway. As soon as I turned around, I was walking away and looked at her and I was like, congratulations, Raja. <laughs> Everybody was gagged. But of course, you know, they cut the audio. And then I was just like, mm. y'all like to play games? Let's play games. <laughs> so you meant it as she was going to win. Yeah. You saw it. Mm-hmm. A lot of people saw it. Uh -huh. It's it's the production as well. It's the production. And so I was not, I didn't come from that. So I didn't really 
get it at the time. And if you'll note it, like that's how Mug for Days like caught on. Everybody was like, Mug, what, what else did she write? If you, because if you remember, I never really said Mug for Days yeah. um, throughout the show, but that became like infamous. Um, another thing that happened after Drag Race was you were on Drag U. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Do you remember those days? Yes. Oh, my gosh. Just from Drag U season two and Drag U season three, like just the accommodations for the professors had sh- changed so much. How did the food change? Did the food change at all? Oh, dr- oh drastically. See, when we were... <laughs> During season three, we would come back into the ro- the workroom after doing interviews or something, and there would just be like room temperature El Pollo Loco tr- styrofoam trays on the workroom table, and it's just like, okay, there you go, figure it out. And now we actually have like catering services. I would go in there, and I'm like, I know I smell salmon somewhere, and it's not in these fucking styrofoam trays. <laughs> Where is the food? And I was like, I even get triggered anytime somebody's like, oh, do y'all want to order El Pollo Look? No, not at all. You know, that's that's pretty funny because I think every single girl from season two or three has said that they had the El Pollo Loco curse. Like it was just El Pollo Loco out there. I don't get it. I, do, I don't, I'm like, I don't know who on the production staff was like, you know what these girls are really going to like? Room temperature chicken and beans. That's going to really get them going. They're going to give us the great television we need to make this last for 20 seasons. (laughs) (laughs) But but the good thing was we had real bottles of Absolute on set. That's what, when I had Raja here a couple of weeks ago, she said that it was like a whole thing where sometimes you guys would steal bottles of Absolute from the interior illusion. You got caught? Okay, so we were just like... Because production's like, oh, okay, yeah, we'll get you some more drinks. Just keep filming. Then, you know, an hour later, two hours later, we still don't have, like, a refresh. So it was just like, girl, hold on. That's a real bottle of vodka. So <laughs> the other girls, the Notorious fight during season three, or well, no, yeah, um, the other girls thought they was going to be able to drink like I drink. Mm-hmm. I can drink mine straight. Mm-hmm. The other girls, <laughs> other girls got a little loopy. And so, um, yeah. They were just like, so from that point, the the alcohol consumption was limited. But we were like sticking in the couches uh-huh. and like sticking it under the couches. And then one day they went into the uh, into one of the lounges to rearrange for like one of the challenges. Uh-huh. And girl, they found all the bottles we were like tucking away. And we were like, stop. <gasps> we went in there and when they were like, uh, oh, taking us to the challenge. And then we went in there and we saw everything moved. We were like. Oh, Miss Thing, they clocked they our bottles. It out. Yeah. So from then on out, it was just like water in the, yeah. I know it's so much tease, but sorry, girls, it came after us. <laughs> in another interview, a quote you gave was drag is for everyone, mm-hmm. but the stage and runway might not be. Are not, yeah. And I stand by that. I love, because so many people, like, I guess you can call them novice or the pedestrians that love to, you know, step their toe in and out and stuff like that. It's it's great. Express yourself. Drag is an extension of uh, who we are on the inside. And it takes us to, it manifests in the physical plane, what we feel in, a, 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 in our psyche and our emotional plane. But I think that because it's so mainstream now, it's so accessible mm-hmm. and it's people think that they have the understanding or the educational background because they watch Drag Race of everything that it takes yeah. to create a persona and to have the confidence and then like mold yourself into this fully realized performer. And it's ever evolving. Mm-hmm. But people just casually come in and think they can do it or critique what you do. And it's for their consumption. And once you put things out there, they have every right to do it. But yes, some places are sacred. And the stage and the ballroom floor is two of those sacred spaces. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of the ballroom floor, Mm -hmm. there's been a lot of discussion recently Mm -hmm revolving around people who are duck walking or people that 
are um, voguing or doing um, any type of ballroom on RuPaul's Drag Race. Yes. Who may not be from the ballroom community. Do you have a a thought on that? Yeah, I do. Um, to put it in perspective, ballroom has been a culture uh, and a people where uh, it was their safe space for brown and black people to go express their creativity and live out fantasies um, in a world that would deny them their reality. And so it's it's very precious and it's our church, it's our family, it's our community. And a lot of people from designers to choreographers to celebrities have come in, taken ideas, inspiration from these creative people who were mm -hmm. given nothing or took nothing and made something absolutely fabulous and distinctively theirs, mm -hmm. they take it to mainstream and all of a sudden want to repackage it with a white face or a lighter face and call it fashion. Now mm -hmm. it's fashion. You were calling us ghetto and hood rats. So it's like, so now when people are taking lingo, taking ideas, taking fashion, taking dance moves and not giving it the respect or giving ballroom the credit that's due, it's it's a slap in the face. Mm -hmm. um, let's let's take duck walking or voguing or uh, a dip. Yeah, for instance, that's the most I guess the common push button. Um, a dip. They just call, they want to they call it on the show and and the young kids have taken it and ran with it a shablam or um, a, death a, a, a death drop. No, it's called a dip. Mm -hmm. You don't go to a ballerina. And tell her, like, oh, do that pointy toe thing. I'm doing that pointy toe thing and just give it your own name. You know, they have their own technical terms for their dance. And those terms are always used when the, the, the queens who are trained in ballet. Yes. They come on the show and use those techniques. They're properly referred to by their dance proper term, right? Mm -hmm. Why is ballroom not giving that same respect? You explain that very, very well. So... When the ballroom people reach out to you on these plat social media platforms that you have and they correct you in the terminology, don't ignore them and then have a whole little mini category for the children of Vogue and then not even have a guest judge or a guest from ballroom community there on the panel. It, 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 it sometimes it, for the community, I can tell you firsthand, it does feel like a slap in the face. Yeah. Well, especially because it's something that is, like you said, so sacred. It's something yeah. that, you know, has a lot of history behind it. And yeah, that challenge to me, I was like, what, what are we doing? It's yeah. It's like, it would have been amazing to have like, um, Deshaun, Jamal Milan or Laomi come in for that little mini challenge, even if it was just for that. Yeah. And like, just speak about the importance of technique and, and, you know, and just give a little bit, um, for that that category, just so that people, the drag race audience can have a little bit more understanding and respect for it. Yeah, I think that that's, that's probably like the most important thing. I think that, yeah, like you can have some of the girls who do these moves or do things, but it's all tying it back. It's all yep. giving the respect and the knowledge and the love and just showing it the respect. Because at the end of the day, you know, history needs to be remembered for the history that it is, not yes. the history that you make it. Yeah, and it's, it's too many people that are always rewriting or taking control of our history and um, and making it theirs mm -hmm. or packaging it as if it's their idea. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But that, that happens in a lot of industries. So you just have to keep addressing it. I'm glad you did address it. And you said it so well. Oh, thanks.